Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we have got a really interesting show today, and yeah. one of our good friends is going to be on, Xander Sprague. Mm -hmm. You'll be talking about Xander. him. And then we've got uh, some other people on to kind of give some support and some uh, understanding about murder. Because we're right. going to be talking about murder and other kinds of losses that are really dramatic like that. Because there's so much that goes on with those and so much uh, trauma. And people think you never get over it. I, you mm -hmm. know, it gets me sometimes when they say, oh, you never get over it. Right. And then at the end of the show, we're going to have um, uh, Alan Peterson sing. Mm -hmm. And he's the executive director of the Compassionate Friends. And we partner with the Compassionate Friends in these videos and the things that we do. It's a great organization, over 700 chapters. And Xander Sprague, our friend, is somebody that we also met at the Compassionate Friends, right? Right. Let me talk a little bit about our guest today. The thing about Xander that I love is, you know, I've known Xander for a long time, and he is such a positive person. And we're going to talk a lot about forgiveness and finding hope after murder. Mm -hmm. And he, despite the fact that his sister Lucy died, at, when she was in her 20s of murder, he's still very, very positive and hope-filled, and we're going to talk about how he got there. Right. Um, now, she uh, died. She was a law student? She was. She was a law student in Chicago. She was in her 20s, and she was actually in her apartment, and somebody came in to rob her. I think it was the superintendent oh of the God. building. He didn't know anybody was home. He, he, you know, she was there, and he ended up murdering her. Oh, my gosh. So it was a horrible thing, and like I said, Xander has taken his, a journey from the darkness out of the darkness and back into the light. Yeah. And we're going to have a couple of other guests. You want to introduce we them? We are. I would love to. So we are also going to have Cochin Paley Ellison and Robert Chodo Campbell. They are co-founders of the New York Zen Center mm. of Contemplative Care. They are very famous. They are Buddhist monks, and they have gone all <laughs> over the world. They're very modest, so they're not going to tell you that. <laughs> but they have gone all over the world talking about hope and healing, and they're going to talk to us a lot about you know, how to get into those places. You know, after you've had a loss, you don't know how you're going to survive. And oftentimes you don't want to. Right. And we get in trouble because we start to obsess about what our future is going to look like and that we've lost it and, you know, that we've lost our past. And they're going to talk to us a lot about living in the present. Great. And just being still and living in the moment mm -hmm. and taking it one minute at a time and one day at a time. Mm -hmm. And then we are going to talk to a wonderful rabbi, Rabbi Sirkman. And Rabbi Sirkman is the senior rabbi of Larchmont Temple. And I just saw uh, Cochin and Chodo and Rabbi Sirkman in a wonderful movie called Mortal. It's a documentary film. And uh, I would definitely have our, our people out there that are watching today, I would recommend you to watch it because it really is how to live your your best life after a loss. Absolutely. Well, fantastic. Yeah. So well, I'm let's excited. welcome Xander. Hi, Xander. Hi, Hi Xander. So great to have you on the show today. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate you so much, and your story is uh, so compelling, and, and how you dealt with it. How long has it been since uh, Lucy was murdered? It's going to be 20 years in December. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a, a t let's talk about murder, because, you know, I know you... Um, uh, go to the Compassionate Friends and we see people there and I know Heidi's mm -hmm. uh, worked with the 9-11 families and, and they certainly talk about their situation as a murder. Right. And what kind of emotions does murder bring up for you? It, or did it? Well, you know, it's interesting because that really wasn't something I thought I would deal with in my life. Right. So I hadn't really ever given it much thought. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden my sister was murdered. And there's the suddenness of the loss. Mm -hmm. There's the, um, you don't understand why. Mm -hmm. You don't have answers. Shocking. And it, well, there's it's, the news, too. Yeah. How did you find out? Um, I got a call from, from my father, and yeah. it was December 9th, 1996. And mm -hmm. it's kind of one of those interesting things where the one time I didn't have, have my pager, yes, a pager, back. back back in the day, mm -hmm. but I didn't have it on me. I was out to dinner and I got back and my dad told, told me what happened and I just, as he started to tell me he had a process, it was a very slow story. Yeah. And I thought he was gonna tell me that, you know, my grand, one of my grandparents might have died or something mm -hmm. and I never, never would have thought that it was that my sister who was murdered. I, I mean, how could you even think about that? I mean, it's like you said, you never would imagine something like that would happen. No, no, yeah. I mean... I mean, here she is a law student, you know. Exactly. She, studying. She, she's a law student. Uh, the irony of the whole thing is the man who killed her was a 
convict and she had just decided that she wanted to be a public defender. Mm -hmm. So she would have been helping the very type of person who ended up killing her. Wow, that's unbelievable. So what kind of feelings do did you feel? And I know you've been around other people with murdered family members. What do you see with them? Do you see any anger, guilt, shame? Certainly there's a lot of anger. There's um, a lot of people get stuck at the, that it's not fair. Mm -hmm. And it isn't fair. Or the why. And um, in my own journey, I sort of, figured out that I had to let that go because mm -hmm. I could spend the rest of my life looking for those answers and I was never going to get why this happened. That's a good point. So a asking yourself why is just, there's no point to it. Because you can keep getting on that track over and over. Why me? Why did this happen to my family? Why did this happen to my sister? Right. And there'll be no answers oftentimes. No. And I was living in Boston at the time. So mm -hmm. sometimes I've talked to people who have been victims of murder and they're like, well, if I had done this different or mm -hmm. if I'd done, and. So there's a guilt factor. There is with. that guilt factor. There's nothing mm -hmm. I could have done. My sister was in Chicago, I was in Boston. There was no reason for me to think that she was in any danger. Right, and, and well, the bottom line is, Xander, we want to believe that we could have done something because we want to believe that we have some control because if we believe we could have done something, then we can, it won't happen again. When the reality is oftentimes there's nothing that we could have done. You know, it's just that we have to realize that sometimes life is unpredictable and, and things happen. Exactly. And, and there are things that we don't, that aren't fair. Mm -hmm. What about the media? I mean, there must have been a huge amount of media. There, there was a lot of media. Um, at the time, my father was a sitting judge in Massachusetts. Oh, wow. So a judge's daughter gets murdered by, by a convict. There was uh, a lot of of media around it. And mm -hmm. that in the in the first week was very challenging because the last thing we wanted to do is talk to the media. We mm -hmm. were right. just trying to figure out what was up. Mm -hmm. um, but you know we did it's talk such an to, invasion, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. It was I mean my father and I flew um, to Chicago the next day, um, had to talk to the police, had to identify my sister mm -hmm. and collect some stuff from her apartment. Um, and we dodged the media all day. It, it, is, it is a whole nother part and layer um, to murder. And, and I did work with uh, firefighter families for 10 years that had lost someone in, in the World Trade Center attacks. And they said that was the part that was so difficult, is feeling the media and they were everywhere and they were hiding and they wanted to get their story. And like you said, to the world, it's everybody's loss, but to you it is, and it's a very personal thing. And oftentimes you want to grieve alone, you know, or without the cameras on you. Exactly. And yeah. and you want to you want to understand, you want to figure out how to breathe again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was your only sibling, right? Actually, I have a younger sister. Okay. Um, so. Not that it matters. No. Because it doesn't. No. And so. Uh, and you know, one of the, the things that was interesting is everyone knew what happened to my sister. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone kept asking how my parents were. Yes. Mm -hmm. But no yes. one asked how I was. Totally. And, and it got me wondering whether my loss was somehow less significant. Right. And there's not, a, I'm not comparing them, mm -hmm. but it isn't less significant. Absolutely, Xander. I mean, I always say the worst loss that can ever happen to us is the one that's kicked us to the ground, stomped on us, and the one that's leaving us there, and the one that is where we don't know how we're going to survive. I mean, when Scott died, my brother, I definitely felt like that. And like you said, society gives us messages, be strong for your parents, and that must have been really hard for your parents. Mm -hmm. So we get those, we hear that all the time. So, Xander, you went ahead and wrote yes. a book. And uh, show us that book and tell us uh, about did. making lemonade, choosing a positive pathway after losing a sibling. I did. I um, you know, when I, after Lucy was killed, mm -hmm. I went looking for literature. And yeah. there really isn't a lot. And I decided to write a book. And mm -hmm. I was lucky enough, I guess, that I had five friends who had also lost siblings who were willing to participate in this book also, and they answered 28 questions um, about their loss. It's been very rewarding to be able to create something to help uh, the sibling survivors. 
um, mm -hmm. in the world because we really are so unacknowledged. Yeah. And uh, you know, I went on and I got my master's in mental health counseling. That's great. Yes, congrats, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, and you've just finished that. I did. Yeah. I just finished that. And the, really, the reason I did that was I kept hearing from my other sibling survivors that. Mm -hmm. um, mental health professionals didn't understand the issues yeah. that, that we face. And I so I really want to try and help change that whole landscape. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. I, I, that's such a fabulous story, and I love what you've done with it. I mean, you've really made lemonade out of, out of lemons. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Serkman, I wondered if you had some comments and thoughts on murder and, and what he's been talking about and anger. Yeah, and no, no. I think, that, first of all, it's, uh, you know, I'm a Bostonian, so I appreciate mm -hmm. the, uh, the shared roots. Um, the, you know, it, it, Jewish tradition says that um, uh, you know, Kol Hamabe Nefesh Echad. Each you know, any person who takes a single soul, um, it actually says loses a single soul, is as if you've lost the world entire. So wow. any any single person is like a whole world, yeah. you know. And the idea of murder, I mean, it's a primary commandment. So we know we know mm -hmm. what Judaism or what the Judeo you know Christian ethic are, which is what we we understand that you know. You, you, to take a life is is, but it really it 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 it, it takes a world away from you, and yeah. so in, in a real way, and of course everybody who saves a life saves a world entire. Um, but but the thing that streak that strikes me is um, is how do you deal with that in the wake of that, and um, and you know clearly you know parents are affected, uh, you know siblings are affected primarily. Um, the family configuration is different. Mm -hmm. How you see yourself in the world is different. How you approach life is different. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, you know, it, it, I'm curious, you know, in, in addition, and, you know, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not doing the interview, but I just, no, it's just, I love it's, it. no, no it's, just it, it's very curious to me. So how do you deal with that? It's all of a sudden, you know, there's a, you know, at the Passover Seder, our traditional Passover meal, we look around and we make, not, make an acknowledgement of the people who, whose seats can never be filled. I mean, you know, so, so how, how do you sort of realign yourself and, 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 and re sort of recreate that family structure and also your life knowing that that, that, that seat can never be filled? That's, that, that to me is the great, the great challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and how did you do it? Uh, I was, this is probably about three, four weeks after Lucy was murdered. I remember I was driving on um, the Massachusetts Turnpike right in Brighton. I and I just where he is. And I, I just I had this epiphany that I was going to have to figure this out on my own, and I needed to choose what I call a positive pathway, mm -hmm. which is to look at this loss, and I needed to define the loss and not have it define me. You like that? Mm -hmm. So many times, people, especially with murder, it's like their life stopped right, right. at that moment, but their life is still going on. They're mm -hmm. still living. And then when they decide that they're ready to deal with it 10 years later, 10 years of their life have gone by. Mm -hmm. And I, I sort of said, I'm a little busier because I have more work to do for Lucy. Oh, I love it. More yeah, work I, to do I, for Lucy. I that, love it, That's too. All, uh, wonderful. I, I resonate with that because I always say I'm living my life not for just me but for my brother also. And I believe that he is my guiding light. And that brings me a lot of comfort. And you don't live your life with fear, Xander. I mean, to me, after a murder, you could you could have lived your life with fear and just like kind of hold up in your home and you know, like you said, stopped fully living. But you're you don't do that. No, I don't. I mean, I I'll be the first to admit that I didn't like visiting Chicago for mm -hmm. many years. But now, um, through um, foundation that my parents and I started, um, I go to Chicago. We created a scholarship in my sister's mm -hmm. memory at the law school for a graduating attorney who's going to public service mm -hmm. to support their work in public mm -hmm. service since that's what my sister was going to do. And um, so now I don't mind going to Chicago. I'm right. not scared like I was before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all part of that choosing a positive pathway. I mean, my whole family sort of said, we want to do good in Lucy's name. Right. And it feels so much better to do good things mm -hmm. than to just wallow in that mire of despair and, and anger. So oh, whereas you, you lost yeah. Lucy, yeah. but you didn't lose Lucy's legacy. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which is like so that. crucial. Yeah. So, so Koshin and Chodo, Koshin, you want to start? What do you think about this? I was hear hearing him say he had to breathe, and I thought about you guys when he said that. Well, it's so rare to actually be present, right? Mm -hmm. And to, in particular, with such a loss, 
and then the anger and all the different feelings are so normal. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, how do we not make a story about it? Mm -hmm. And that's when I think, as you were saying, we go into why and you know only if, which is also so normal. So we have to give space for that. But also, what about right now? Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's about balancing for me about no shame or blame about having these very normal feelings. Mm -hmm. But how do you also fully participate and what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. And that's In a hard moment. one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Fully participating. Whoa. I remember yeah. myself. I mean, you're you're off in the accident or the you know, mm -hmm. early on you're in that space of seeing, reliving, you know, uh, the sign respirations, the you know, not being able to sleep, you know, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, how about you, Coach? It's a huge, huge topic. Uh, I actually witnessed a murder in my 20s uh, in London, and I remember at the time uh, it was a, you know, one of those random acts of violence. It was a, a scene in a nightclub, holding this 20-something kid in my arms, wow. and um, knowing actually that he w was dead, mm -hmm. but trying to, um, trying to keep the whole situation not getting into chaos with yeah. the rest of the people in the club and you know making sure the police were called and the ambulance but holding this kid this 24 year old kid mm. and seeing the where he'd been stabbed directly yeah. you know straight into the heart and and that stayed with me for for a long long time and you know the work that we do now and with hospice patients or with hospital patients there's something very different to watching a person die in the, through the natural process or you know even through illness but it's a slow death as opposed to yeah. in a moment. You know, there's, yeah. there's no, there doesn't seem to be any uh, way to can get you wrap your mind so, around. So, so I'm curious, given that, um, Coach and Nichoto, how though, so you've, when you've had a trauma, a traumatic loss, which I think so many are, even no matter how people die, it's traumatic for us. How do people go on to find hope and how do they go on to live life fully again and be present and live life with joy? Well, I think they do it in a lot of different ways. Okay. I think of a story from the Buddhist tradition about a woman named Kisukotami. Mm -hmm. And she was a woman, you know, lived about 2,600 years ago. And she wanted a child so badly. And she finally had a little boy. Mm -hmm. And when he was around two years old, he died. And she was so overwhelmed with the grief that she started walking around with her dead child. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways that's what you know this kind of loss is like. Uh, we're, yeah. We really are carrying it. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a good point. Yeah, you are walking around with mm -hmm. a dead child. I, I, what came up for me when you said that was that nowadays um, we're smart enough when babies and kids die that we let people be with the babies and mm -hmm. then they're to support them to we take them a, away, so there's a, yeah, but I love that analogy of care, and even though you don't have the physical presence, you can keep carrying it mm -hmm. the way you know, forever that way. Yeah. We have a, uh, a tradition, a ceremony in our tradition where once a year we hold a special day for women who have um, lost a baby through mm -hmm. miscarriage, abortion, or stillbirth, mm -hmm. and it's an incredible opportunity for parents to commemorate the mm -hmm. the loss of a child, whether it's yeah. a fetus or a fully formed stillborn baby. Um, and in many, many cultures, abortion is seen as, as murder. Mm -hmm. And we've had parents in our community who felt that they did murder their child. Wow. And how could they come to closure with this through mm -hmm. this ceremony of giving it a name, giving the child a name, and then through a series of, of rituals, really coming to a place of, of wholeness with that. And that's a way, it's an incredibly moving way for, uh, to allow the process to, to move forward in their life. So it's a different, it's a different way of looking at murder and, and working through it, but it's an incredibly... And so they forgive themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Koshin's, I mean, you know, love, love the story. 
Rabbi Harold Kushner tells the story, that, you know, he tells the story of a woman who came into his study in, in, uh, in Natick, not far from the Mass Pike, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, he, it was, uh, I think, the 10th anniversary of her divorce, and he asked her, he said, he said, so how are you feeling? He said, she said, I'm still angry, and I'm, I'm, I'm still grief-stricken. He said, he said, you think your husband, your former husband is feeling this? He said, you're carrying this around. Mm -hmm. Isn't it heavy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. and so part of I think you know, and and, and part of the, the sense of murder is just an inexplicable, immediate loss of love of that of, of the loved one, but not of the love. Right. And so you you have to figure out how to how do you recalibrate, how do you adjust, and how do you not carry it with you? Right. One of the things that that came, I was talking um, at a uh, conference to a whole bunch. It was me and another sibling and we're mm -hmm. talking to parents who had lost their child and one of the mothers was very grief stricken and I asked how old her son was she said he was 25 and I said I have a question for you do you want to focus on the on that little dot that is the end of your son's life or the rainbow that was his life mm -hmm. I choose the rainbow Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, wow. a, that's beautiful and I, I love it Xander what you're talking about because I know people watch this and they say well, you know, you never get over it, and and you you know you've just gone on to do wonderful things in her name. I mean, uh, you, it transforms it transforms it. Right, you don't get over the loss. I mean, we we talk about this all the time. We work our way through it. Right. Perhaps I've worked my way through it in in, in a more positive way than other people, but. I want to I want to help people work their way through this. And, and I think as the grief transforms, I've learned how to establish a new and different relationship with Scott. Yeah. So you know, I'm bringing him with me in the journey, and we have a continuing bond in a, in a different way now. And at first, I didn't want to have that continuing bond because I wanted him here. So people were like, "Oh, eventually you're going to have a bond with him." I'm like, "I don't want that. I want him here in this room now." So it took me a while to say, "Okay, you know what? That's not going to happen." How am I going to carry him throughout my life? And he, he does live forever in my heart and in my memories. And he's, he's such a big part of my life every day. Mm -hmm. Well, what I want to do before we end the show today is I want to go around and ask everybody, because I know uh, some of you out there watching this show today are uh, people that have had a recent loss. And it's got to be really quick. Give me one quick thing that uh, they can do. I, I, I say make a video that expresses your your feelings and maybe this person's life. All right, mm -hmm. Rabbi. Uh, the Kaddish, which is the prayer we say to remember the dead in our lives, those who are no longer here, the prayer for the dead and, and memory, has nothing about death in it. It's a prayer for the affirmation of the gifts of life. Mm. So I would say continue the conversation by thinking about what's the gift or the gifts that they've given you that you can make real and can, you know, because a gift you can open every day. Mm. Okay, great. To just imagine how the person has impacted your life, very similar to what the good right. rabbi is saying. But to really appreciate that we are because of all the people in our life, okay. including those that we've lost. And to really look at how they are with us still, because where did they go? Mm -hmm. yeah. Lovely, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the things that I do in my grief counseling is I ask the uh, the bereaved to write a letter okay. to the person that was that was lost and it's a really it can be a really healing exercise to just talk about how how shocked how horrified how angry how all filled with whatever emotions it is to actually get that out of here and into the world by writing it on a piece of paper, not on your computer, but actually writing it. Right. It can be a wonderful healing tool. And then I asked them to, a few weeks later to write a letter from the deceased back to them. Wow. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I like and to, to sort of yeah. complete the circle. It can be a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. Great. Well, thank you all for being on the show today thank and thank for you. your great information and for your great hearts and for all the good you're doing in the world. And thanks, everybody, for watching the show today. And we're now going to hear from Alan Peterson, the executive director for the Compassionate Friends. And he is going to sing for us tonight, I Hold This Candle. Tonight I hold this candle In memory of you 
Hoping some way, somehow My love will shine through I close my eyes Lost in the glow There are so many things That I want you to know this candle says I love you This candle says I miss you This candle is saying That I remember you When I'm holding it toward heaven Feels like you are near If you're looking down tonight And see this candle burning bright It says I'm wishing you were here In the glow of this candle I can almost see your smile And it carries me away For a little while To another time Another place When all it took to light up my world Was your beautiful face This candle says I love you this candle says I miss you This candle is saying That I remember you When I'm holding it toward heaven It feels like you are near If you're looking down tonight and see this candle burning bright It says I'm wishing you were here Well someday 